Hello everybody, it's Mike Al with Savage Kingdoms Role Playing Game and Fire in the Head Productions. This will be the fourth video in the series of the Savage Kingdoms of the West. So I'm doing these little videos, the last about 30 minutes. Uh, hopefully you guys have watched some of the early ones about Eridor and Brithia and or Cairnia, or Cairndon. Um, this one will be about Kimrith. So this is one of the 13 playable cultures or nationalities or sub-races, human sub-races, of the western continent of Astagonia, so which is what's featured in the core rulebook. Right. So today will be Kimrith, as mentioned. Um, and a good way to start with Kimrith, in addition to showing you what page we are on this in the uh, core rulebook, there's our Kimrithy uh, featured artwork there. Whoops. As you can see, Kimrithy man there, he's got some blue woad on his face. He looks quite menacing. He's got a fur draped around him, a large sword, etc. So the first thing I will cover with the Kim Rethi is how to pronounce it. Um, a lot of people mispronounce this one, and rightly so. So it's spelled C-Y-M-R-E-D-D-I, right? So most people might think it's Sim Reddy, maybe even Kim Reddy, if you want to go with a hard C, which is what you should be doing. Um, but it's actually based on Welsh, on Celtic Welsh, or, or Kimrick. And or Kumrik. So that way, so the C is hard, K, like most Celtic C's. S's are S's. Believe, God forbid, right? Uh, and then a double D sound is like a soft TH. So red, instead of ready, it's ready. So Kim ready. Kim ready. There we go. Uh, it's actually, I think, phonetically spelled out in there. So if you, um, so the people of Kimrith. It's literally Kimrath, and then the Kimrathi or Kimrathi. So, not Kimrathi, not Simrathi, but Kimrathi. And if you're Kimrathi, you're from Kimrath. All right, so, speaking of Kimrath, Kimrath is a, uh, here, I'll just actually kind of read from the book. There's only a few paragraphs. The people of Kimrath are a wild and savage lot, living in various tribes, made up of various, of several familial clans. Because of this, Kimrath is not a unified sovereign realm. Or rather a collection of powerful tribes, the most the most superior at present being the Kimrathi themselves. As such, the realm or territory tends to bear the general name Kimrath, although in the not so distant past it was known as Gwindian, when an, when an offshoot of the Managwini tribe was the most dominant. Why am I staggering over the, my words that I wrote? The Kimrethi live primarily in small woodland villages, although some of the greater clans have great cares, which means fortress. Fortress is uh, C-A-E-R. Some of which are quite ancient and are said to have been originally built by the she-folk. Ker uh, Avalok, Ker Llewellyn, and Kimrath, because um, there's a place actually called Kimrath, are several well-known examples. They are superstitious people. They are superstitious people for the most part, distrusting written language and even to a large extent the sea, which is interesting because it's a, a coastal territory. Physically, the Kimrathi are typically of medium height and build, with deep auburn or deep or dark brown hair, fair-skinned and gray, green gray-eyed. Most paint themselves with blue woad using swirling patterns and knotwork designs which help camouflage them in forest terrain and dedicate them to the gods and the ancient face spirits of field and stream. In real-world terms, the wild folk of Kimrith resemble the Kimri, or Kumri, or the, the Celtic Welsh. More information about Kimrith can be found in Chapter 20 of the Savage West, also known as the Gazetteer Chapter, which I will go to uh, shortly. But All right, so that's the, uh, the description of the Kimrithi people. Fairly brief. I didn't want to like overdo it this time in the core rule book because you can, you can flip to the chapter I just talked about because it's your chapter to get more information. This is just to kind of give people uh, when you choose to play a character that's Kim Rathi or wherever. Uh, it just kind of gives you a, a kind of a basic thing without slogging it down into too much detail. All right. So next we have their attribute arrays. So how you can arrange your attributes. There's six attributes in the in the game system, as you all most likely know: agility, physique, vigor, intellect, magnetism, magnetism, and willpower. Um, so the Kimrethi feature, without reading it all out, um, the Kimrethi are better at agility, vigor, and willpower. That's their three. So all the human cultures have three attributes that are 
that they could start a little higher with, or potentially start a little bit, depends on what you put there. Um, so in other words, in a jelly, they could start with a minimum of minus two, maximum of plus four, and absolute maximum is plus six. So that's the, the maximum they could ever, ever attain, attain through advancement. Uh, same with um, vigor. Minus two plus four to start with, uh, absolute max of plus six, and willpower minus, minus which is also minus two or plus four uh, to st starting range, and then plus six maximum as well. Uh, special abilities that have wild affinity can readily receive a plus one bonus to acrobatics, athle athletics, perception, stealth, and survival roles made in forests or marshlands. Uh, their second racial ability is their, um, is woad warrior. That's one of my kind of favorite names for a weird racial thing. Woad Warrior, because, you know, they wear woad and stuff. Uh, Kimra, the characters pay two points less for the body painting talent. Decorating the body with blue and other dyes is a regular part of Kimra, the culture. So they pay two points less for that, which means they get it for one point. So I've seen most char Kimra, the characters take it, because why not? It's only one point. Not not every, but most of them. Uh, right, skill specialties. Kimra, the characters receive three free skill specialties at character creation that help reflect camera the culture and virtues this is like all the other human nationalities you get you get to choose the three free skill specialties even if you don't have three skill levels in a particular skill this is a culture thing you, you grew up around it is basically what it represents so even though you might not even have any particular training in say acrobatics balancing or leaping just the fact that your culture it's you're just couched in that you're going to be exposed to it to some degree regardless of what you claim um or don't choose one and then maybe you, you can claim that to be actually true so some of the examples would be uh let's start with the weapon ones um melee weaponry so there's specialties they can choose from that is clubs daggers hand axes spears or war clubs uh, range weaponry clubs slings or war darts slash javelins because it's really the same stats it's just that uh, they, they're like really heavy throwing darts that have the same stats as a javelin. Um, endurance, resist poison is an option. I'm just going to grab a few of them really quick here. Animal handling, dogs, hawks, or wolves. Survival, foraging, forest, marsh, or hunting specialties. Um, herbalism, healing, poisonous, or woad making as their specialties. And there's several other options as well. It's cool. All right, so favorite talents. Not going to go into all of those. But suffice to say that uh, looks like battle talents are, are quite the most. It is a, a pretty warrior, warlike culture, a very war, uh, hunter-gatherer, uh, warrior-type culture. So one might, might expect the battle talents to be fairly numerous. Um, blood talents, uh, they actually have several favored blood talents. Goblin-blooded, lycanthrope, uh, specifically wolf, and then specifically only if you're from the Dufanan or Druithi tribes, uh, because they kind of worship this uh, this ancient god slash possible demon uh, called um, Dufan or Duvan, uh, just also known as the Wolf Lord, who actually came into play in one campaign I ran, I ran once, or at least some avatar thereof. Um, mystical talents, they have a few that are favored. And again, just to reiterate, favored talents it means you pay one point less for them. Uh, it doesn't mean that's your only options. You can, if you qualify for a talent, like you meet all the prerequisites, you can grab it. You can snag it. Uh, you just may not, it may not be a favorite talent. You may have to pay full price for it, for your character. Uh, social talents, not really. There's only like three. I think it's uh, uh, Bard, Champion, and Woodsman uh, is favored. Subterfuge, a decent amount, as you would expect. They're, they're, they're fairly um, covert. They can be very covert, very hidden people. Hunter, Poisoner, Raider, Secret Strike, and Trap Setter are their favorite sub uh, subterfuge talents. And then they have a fair number of other talents, which includes things like Light Sleeper, Animal Kinship, Fleet of Foot, uh, Beast Companion, etc. All right, favorite weaknesses for the Kim Um I'll read these because there's only a few. Uh, addiction to Woad, because uh, Woad is, does have an addictive quality, which I think is why it's illegal in the States now, or used to be. When I was in the SCA, a lot of us uh, gamer types, particularly somewhat more athletic gamer types, have fought in the SCA, Society for Creative Anachronism, and some other groups too that did some like live interactive medieval combat warfare, including some of the the more even some of the LARPs that kind of get a little bit more into the uh, the more heavy quote realistic combat. 
Um, so having fought some of those, uh, I did wear woad once or twice, like real woad that was brought over from the UK. And I don't remember it really having an addictive quality, but people say that if you wear it a lot, it does have a slight hallucinogenic effect. Uh, so historically speaking, uh, woad wearing peoples, uh, the Celts were particularly known for it. Um, it's thought that they, because they were kind of lightheaded, that they probably were more fierce in battle because that they're, they would be more fearless, right? Uh, possibly making more foolish mistakes, but you know, uh, more fearless, I would assume. So anyway, so it is possible to be addicted to woad apparently. And so that's why I included that. Uh, all right. So continuing on Gaius slash taboo, favorite weaknesses, oath bound, Phobia of large fires or the sea, savage, short, zealot of Duvan, uh, and Druithi variant, tribe only. Um, so yeah, you can choose any other weaknesses, but these are the favored ones, meaning that you gain a bonus point if you choose one of them, because they're kind of, you know, they show up more in this culture. Starting languages, you start with Kimrethi as your native tongue. Imagine that, shocker. And you automatically know a second tongue if your intellect is minus one or better. This is like with all the other cultures. From among the following. Um, Brithian, Cairnian, Ismundian, Garnic, Goblin Tongue, or She. So that's your free language option if you have an intellect of minus one or better, meaning that uh, intellect of slightly below average or better. Um... Yeah, and the Kimrethi language is, um, I mean, I haven't really, I've written a few words of it, but usually I kind of use Kelsh, Welsh words, uh, care and broad, I think means raven, and uh, bren means hill. So I know some um, ancient Welsh, and I, we kind of use that when we're playing around. I haven't really written a language, but if I did, it would be, it would sound like, like that. So those of you who are role-playing Kimrethi, and you, and you know maybe a little bit about uh, Welsh, particularly Welsh Arthurian, Mabinogian era, uh, Cumric Welsh, um, pre Anglo Saxon in particular, pre Roman, certainly, not that the Romans had much of a foothold in Wales. Um, if you know anything about that, that's it, you can maybe draw some of that resonance from that if you want to really know how the language sounds like, if you, if you care. So, all right, sample names Braun, Kim, Wol uh, Ken Wolf. Ian, Llewellyn, Maddock, Mordrin, and Taliesin, or, Tali uh, or Taliesin, which is male. Those are male names. Some of those are drawn from, uh, you probably recognize some of the broad is fairly common. I don't think it isn't much anymore, but I think it means raven. Uh, but it was in ancient Welsh. It was very common. Ian, you still hear that name. It's spelled typically spelled I-A-I-N in a more uh, Welsh Celtic way, whereas nowadays we typically spell it I-A-N, but it's the same sound. Um, just like the word Britain, it looks like it's spelled, it would be Britain, but it's Britain. It's just like, that's, so that, that's kind of where that naming scheme comes from. Uh, the old, uh, what, Pictish or Celtic uh, name for uh, Britain uh, was uh, Pryden. Uh, it looks like it's spelled Prydain, but again, using the same uh, pronunciation, it's, it's uh, an an sound at the end and not an Ain, so that's why you get in and not Ein or Ein. Yeah. Moving on. All right. So Llewellyn, pretty no, still a fairly popular Welsh name, I believe. Maddock is a cool name. Mordrin. Oh, that's kind of where the the Arthurian sort of sinister antagonist comes from. A lot of those names are, are couched or couched in Welsh. Uh, and then there's uh, Taliesin or Taliesin. Um, also very potent and a very kind of myth, myth, mythical Welsh name. All right, female names that are samples. Uh, Bronwyn, Cameron, Gwyn, Gwyneth, Morgana, Saren, and Salura. So to cover some of those names really quick, some of these names you've heard before. Gwyn, you still hear occasionally. Gwyn actually just means white or fair. Um, Gwyneth, so let's see, what's, what's her name? Gwyneth Paltrow, right? Kind of a somewhat well-known actress. Um, her name is spelled with a TH at the end, but it would have been spelled, if you're spelling a traditional uh, Welsh, it would have a double D uh, at the end, so Gwyneth. But, you know, to anglicize it, you just put the TH there, because that's how you pronounce, you know, that's phonetically how it sounds like. 
So just an interesting little thing there. So um, her name would mean something like fairest, fairest one, fair one, something like that. So um, you can see what would be a popular name for girls or whatever. Uh, Morgana is kind of cool because it's kind of based in the, on like Morgan Le Fay or Morgana Le Fay, uh, the Fay. And then Saren, I think, means star in um, Welsh. Saren, cool, cool name. And Salura is kind of a cool Celtic name too. I think I used to know what that. Is. Something to do with the moon. I think I don't know. I could be wrong. Probably I'm wrong. Uh, Kim Rathy generally use ap, which means son of, or verk, which means daughter of, after their first names. Though renowned heroes and chieftains might have a title, or, a title or epithet, such as the Black or the Worm Slayer, for example. So yeah, so if you hear like Kim Wolf ap Ian, that means uh, uh, Ken Wolf son of Ian. For example, or Llewellyn Appomatic, uh, Llewellyn son of of Matic. Um, it could also denote like a clan name, like if it's the father's well known. So instead of just referring specifically to Matic or whatever in this case, or Ian, I may refer refer to the clan of Matic or Ian. Like maybe it's a somewhat well known larger family. So it could it could go either way, but it it more literally means son of. Um, all right, and Verk means daughter of, which is spelled V-E-R-C-H, uh, hard C-H, not ch, not Verk, so Verk, um, and that just means daughter of. So, for example, Bronwyn Verk Gwyn would be Bronwyn, daughter of Gwyn, or Bronwyn Verk uh, Kinwolf, daughter of Kinwolf, etc. So, right, moving on. Um, cultural items. You may choose one of the following items at character creation, just like all the other uh, human and non-human options. Uh, or you can choose two by spending a log point to complement the rest of your gear that you may otherwise purchase uh, or start with. Uh, let's see. Some, you know, I'll just go with those really quick. Cold Iron Dagger harms fairy creatures better than four fire forged iron or steel. So this goes back to the whole fairy lore thing, particularly in Savage Kingdoms where cold iron, iron that's not been touched by fire, that's not been, in other words, basically non-steel uh, cold iron that you have to, hammer out and forge without the use of fire, which is pretty difficult. That apparently does uh, extra damage to fey creatures in Savage Kingdoms uh, and a lot of other role-playing games too. D&D, for some reason, 5th edition doesn't really, I mean, you could put that in there if you want, but it seems to have ignored that for some bizarre reason. Um, maybe it's just too muddled or something. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of cool. Vial of Special Road grants plus one to Vigor for one hour. It's two uses. Not work or animal motif tattoo of blue or black ink grants plus one to renown. So, you know, you have this cool, like, tattoo pattern, and, you know, you're sort of known for it. Uh, small animal companion, crow, hare, uh, hare as in rabbit, or mouse. Uh, and it knows one trick per level of animal handling. Two cold iron tipped arrows or sling bullets. Does greater harm to fairy creatures. Again, the cold iron thing. Ancient copper dagger of exceptional quality. Uh, you use base dagger stats plus one to your renown, which is pretty good because copper um, is a weaker metal than iron and certainly steel. Uh, but because it's exceptional quality, you still get to use the, the regular dagger stats. Uh, copper to a lot of ancient peoples kind of had some uh, kind of cool resonance and almost like sacrificial sort of powers to them and that sort of thing. So that's where that's coming from. Talismanic fetish item. Fetish is in uh, the shamanic term fetish. Uh, fish, boar, or wolf, plus one to magical arts life skill rolls by possessing this talisman, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, she forged dagger or pair of arrows, exceptional quality, plus one to maximum damage, uh, which, you know, which is all max, uh, exceptional quality weapons do that. So she forged dagger or pair of arrows that do that. Solid bronze or silver plated torque, plus one to your renown. And it's worth 10 plus 1d20 silver coins in case you wanted to pawn it or sell it or something. So what's a torque, you might ask. Most of you probably know. It's spelled T-O-R-C, typ uh, typically not T-O-R-Q-U-E, which means something else. But a torque is a, um, like the last video, I have one. Um, I'm going to get it this time. Hold on. Aha. Well, I meant to show you last time when I was doing the Karenia thing. This is a torque. So you wear it around your neck. I like it. I've had this one for 20, 18 to 20 years. It's made by the Crafty Celts. Shout out to them. I think they're based in South Carolina, so just one state below me. Um, 
I see them at Celtic festivals and Dragon Con and that kind of stuff. So this is a torque. It's an, a Celtic neck piece. It was often worn uh, by chieftains, but also by champions, people of some status. Uh, men and women both wore them in Celtic society. So and the reason I'm going over Celtic society is because the Kimrathi, again, are based on Celtic Welsh. Men and women are very equal, um, which is really cool. We kind of got away from that, and now we're getting back to it a little bit, which is cool. Some of it's a little overforced, but anyway, we're getting back to it, which is cool. Uh, so, yeah, so men and women both wear torques. Women typically had the like lighter ones. Men would have like the thicker ones, kind of like this. Some would be even bigger, like a chieftain. And they would end in, uh, this is called a terminus. Um, those are wolf, those are, uh, those are called draconic wolf heads. So as you can see, they're styled, they're wolves, but they're kind of stylized. So a dragon wolf was kind of like a cool sort of Celtic combination creature, almost a, a gorgonic, a chimeric sort of thing. Um, because wolves and dragons were, you know, they were a big thing in boars, particularly in, uh, Celtic mythology and his, in history. So anyway, that's my talk. That's a long way of going about showing that off, isn't it? So, uh, general code of honor for the Kimrethi. Uh, these are just a general, you know, life code that they typically live. Doesn't mean everybody, every character has to, but it's a good guideline to how to play your character if you need to look at it, look back at it, uh, or even to look at it and go, I'm, I'm going to be the opposite of that. I'm going to be kind of different. So it gives you a basis instead of just this random free for all and you have no idea how to play the character. So, General Code of Honor, avenge all clan members slain unjustly, either by blood or sarhade, which means life price. So, you've probably heard Weregild, right? It's more of a, an, an Anglo-Saxon and Viking term, meaning mangold. So, sarhade is, uh, is kind of the Welsh uh, version of, basically means the same, it really means life price, but it's essentially Weregild, man, mangold. So, meaning that... Um, Everybody kind of has a price in society, like a worth. Um, if you kill someone unjustly, particularly in your clan or tribe, you may have to pay the, the clan or family sarhade, so some compensation for killing that uh, that person, in addition to whatever other repercussions that may be headed your way. All right, avenge, but if you, if you pay it, hopefully retributions won't be coming your way, so to make that clear. Avenge serious personal insults by single combat or by physical competition. Uh, so again, it's a very it's a warlike culture and a very honor based culture. So they don't take insults that unless you clearly are among people and you're drinking or whatever and you're having a good time and you're clearly among kinsmen that you know and trust and you're ribbing each other and that stuff. Uh, I'm rehearsing a play right now called The Weir, where we're always, we're, uh, in, in Sionish, of course, we're going back and forth, insulting all, each other all the time. But we know each other, so it's not a big deal. So it's kind of that kind of thing. But a serious insult, someone outside your clan you don't know, is like, makes some kind of remark. Yeah, it's like, what, come on, what are you doing? So that would require either a public apology, meaning people witnessed that, you're the person's, um, or uh, single combat, or it even mentions physical competition. Hey, let's, let's, I mean, I can beat you to the lake and back or whatever. Uh, but typically it's probably going to be single combat if it's pretty serious. Uh, if it's like a minor thing, you know, most of them would just kind of blow it off or scoff like, Psh, yeah, whatever, you're not even worth it. All right, number three, beware the writing of languages for such words can be captured or stolen. So this is kind of interesting about Kim Reddy. They don't like to write. They, very few of them write. The only ones that, well, basically none of them, the only ones that would write anything are the Druids. Uh, which are the priests of that culture, they um, draw, there's a druidic secret language, which is kind of, um, it's a uh, somatic thing I'm doing with my hands, like it's like you can make gestures in the air to communicate, so it's very basic, but uh, they also wrote, would write in what's called oam, uh, which is means tree tongue or tree language, and it's like carvings on trees, um, uses kind of a straight line and you put different little tick marks and X's that mean different sounds, you know, different letters, but almost like runes, basically a form of runes, shall we say. Uh, other than that, nobody would read or write. It's all, uh, the, the, the point being that they fear if you write something down and this is, was true big time. So I say the Roman era where the Romans began writing everything down, things would get captured. And then suddenly that, person, particularly an enemy, has all access to all of that. Once they can figure out the language, break the code, uh, or they can, they find someone who speaks it or reads it, 
then suddenly they have all of that stuff. So write, reading and writing obviously is a cool thing, but there are, there are drawbacks to it. There were reasons certain cultures uh, sort of pushed back on it for a little for a little while. But you know now they almost the entire world reads and writes, which is cool. So, but anyway, that's the the cool role playing reason why uh, being captured or stolen. So. Uh, a little deeper than that, they also believe that words, uh, that written word has, um, it has like, a, there's almost like a taboo to it. Like only those that are like the Druids that are really blessed by the gods, leaders in the in the community. So maybe even a chieftain might learn to read or write slightly, uh, should really have access to that. And the common person doesn't need to worry about that. Um, another cool side effect to, and this has been proven by historic, well, sort of proven by historians, uh, a lot of the Celts that had an oral-based society, particularly bards, real historical bards, they memorized all of these songs and epics and poems. Um, and speaking as an actor, trying to memorize dialogue and monologue, that's part part of what we do. But it's amazing to think back. Like, sometimes I'll struggle with a two-page monologue. Uh, I mean, I'll eventually get it, of course. And But to think back that some of those people back then were memorizing hundreds of pages if they were written down uh so historians have proven that it seems like memory some of those cultures uh, the memories of people just the sheer brain power uh of, of particularly memorization was probably superior in some ways to even us nowadays because they we rely so much on computers and writing back, back then it was all it was all here you had to memorize you had to do the thing and just do it um probably if you Forgot a few things. You uh, a bard was probably really good at ad libbing, so as long as you kind of know where you are, you can add a few words here and there. But uh, and then words, uh, songs, and poems would have changed uh, just through the telling. Uh, you know, oral history does that, so every song kind of grows and changes a little different, and you have all these different little versions. Uh, Shakespeare, who wrote things down, there's something like thirty different versions of Romeo and Juliet because you know different versions were written down, or somebody committed something to memory, and then they try to write it down later. So anyway, that's a long about way of saying uh, memorization is also a really good thing, and don't forget it. All right, continuing on. Honor and obey clan and tribal chieftains unless they have shown, to be, shown themselves to be corrupt. So in other words, you honor their station, but if they're clearly leading you in the wrong way or they're corrupt in some ways, they're trafficking with demons or making... Uh, deals with clearly enemy tribes, <coughs> excuse me, or particularly foreigners that you don't trust, and yeah, maybe call them into question. All right, honor and obey all tribal druids and shamans unless proven dishonorable. So more or less what I just said. The first one talked about chiefs and this one's about druids and shamans unless proven dishonorable. Honor and respect nature and the general gods. Use what you kill and only kill when in need. So nature is uppercase N there. The gods. So pretty much all the druidic pantheon is really fairly, it's pretty nature based. You know, it's a very wild, you see a very primal elemental culture. Uh, so it says, use what you kill and only kill what it needs. So, in other words, when, when you hunt, um, a lot of ancient cultures were good about this. The ancient Celts, Native Americans, um, when you, and, and most hunters nowadays, I think, are good about this too. So, when you kill an animal, hopefully it's not out of sport. Uh, if it is, then that's your thing. But use it, like honor it. Use it, like use it for food. Use um, use the use the uh, the muscle for the sinew for bowstrings. Use the the antlers for digging tools. So uh, a lot of ancient peoples were really good about using the, the body parts of the animal they killed because it, at least that means the creature didn't die in vain, and at least you're being you're using that creature you're to to sustain yourself. So it's just uh, it's just was necessary. Uh, okay, so that's it from the um, core rule book. Um, I mean, not for the core rule book, just from that chapter. There's, I'm going to, uh, another minute or two here. I'm just going to go to the uh, the Gazetteer chapter and just see what, what is in there about Kimrith. So, uh, can I remember what I wrote at the time of the stuff? All right, Kimrith, here we go. Here's a map of Kimrith. The territory. I mean, you could say kingdom or realm, but it's you know again, as I mentioned earlier in the the uh, 
the video. It's not a united realm. So just to reiterate, reiterate on that again, so uh, the, the main tribe, the most powerful tribe in that region are known as the Kimrethi. And that's why the area is kind of known as Kimrith. So say if you were to travel, I don't know if you could see on the map, but the, one of the other major uh, tribes is called the Menagwini. They, they mostly in southern Kimrith. The Jurithi, they're kind of in far north uh, east, almost in Great. Well, some of them are in actual Greymoor, that giant, giant marsh area. And the Dufanon are kind of in the north. Those are kind of the three other main tribes. So if one of them tribes goes really big, especially like the Jurithi, who are always kind of fighting with people, particularly the Kimrethi, if one of them ends up wiping out the other tribe or dominating, then maybe the realm eventually becomes known as uh, Jurithion or Jurithi or Jur Jurithwin or something like that. Um, so the Menagwini used to be the more primary tribe, and that's why it's called, the last part of their name is Gwyn, is Gwyndian. Uh, so yeah, so just an interesting little note right there. Anything else really quick before I wrap up the video? Um, oh yeah, religion. Religion, religion. Major thing. Uh, often gets overlooked in, in these games, but it's such a rich, cool thing that uh, it's. I think it's silly to ignore. The people of Kimrith hold deep beliefs in the old gods of the West and hold in particular Luella Ravendark in reverence, perhaps almost to rival Brianna, the triple goddess, queen of the Western deities. Cormac is also widely worshipped, especially by men and warrior hunters, and even Gelrith of the Sea and Bronfinnan the Traveler are held in regard. So that paragraph right there just kind of summarizes all five of the major uh, Western gods of the Druidic pantheon, so to speak, or the the Garenic and uh, Gwynic um, Kimrethi uh, pantheon. So you have uh, Luella, or Luella Ravendark, as she is fully called, Brannon, uh, Cormac, Gelrith, and Bronfinnan. And again, just because there's only five that I've detailed, that doesn't mean that's literally only the five gods. They're dozens probably hundreds of other very minor local gods uh fairy spirits uh that people might think are gods uh, again i think it's easy as gamers to go these are the categories there's gods and demons and there's uh, angels and there's fairies it's like that's great for gamers for us to know especially as a game master but realistically believably most people don't know the difference like god is is a demon to them a demon is a is an angel maybe but in fact that would actually be more or less correct a, a powerful fairy is a, essentially a god um so just just kind of keep that in mind i know, I know it's a side note but uh since we're on the subject it triggered it right um so yeah and the druid priests kind of cover those uh or sort of the spokespeople of those gods and omen re readers representing those gods here on Earth. Uh, another quick side note, remember that uh, deities and savage kingdoms may not even exist. The gods may not exist, or maybe only one or two of them do. And maybe if they do, they're not really as we think of gods. They're just greater beings that happen to live in the other world now. Or maybe they don't live in the other world. Maybe they live in the Earth world, which is, you know, the prime material plane in savage kingdoms. Um, so yeah, just keep all that in mind. So a lot of that's deliberately left mysterious i've done that on purpose uh you as an indiv individual game master you can plot it out more if you want and you can say no i'm gonna have the gods clearly exist that's totally yeah go for it but as written um it's supposed to be deliberately very mysterious i i like deities being mysterious and not quite sure where they exist and the characters that are super pious and zealous they think they exist and maybe they do and other people may not so um uh, but in general, people do see spirits and gods in, in this time uh, in history, Dark Ages, uh, as, as well as this fantasy setting based in the Dark Ages. People do see a lot of uh, supernatural and super powerful and preternatural natural things happening in the environment that they might equate to gods or fairy spirits and that sort of thing. So, all right, I think that's about it. Um, oh, yeah, Kimrith is primarily mountains in the north. Uh, otherwise, it's very heavily forested. It's about looks to be about 60% forested, like the whole territory, or 70% probably. It's on the coast, which is interesting because a lot of the Kimberley really don't really like the sea and they don't connect very well with it. Some will, they do some fishing, but they're not very deep sea explorers. Um, so that that's kind of interesting. I want to do that. I just find that dichotomy very interesting. Um, I think that's it. And then you can read the chapter about all the other notable characters and that stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm going to wrap up because it's 34 minutes. So thanks for tuning in. 
Please like and subscribe and share. I, I feel like one of those YouTubers now, even though I'm not that much of one. I don't even edit these things, as you can tell. Uh, but yeah, like and subscribe. Let's get more people watching these things and get more excited about the game. I, I'm really trying to get some stuff going here. So please uh, you know, do what you can. I appreciate it. So thanks for checking this out. That's going to wrap up as my wife crosses in the background. The little thing about Kim Reddy, and I will talk to you guys again soon.